Now, one more thing that, uh, that I want to emphasize before we start taking the seal apart. Um, ideally, what you want to do is use some practices so that once the seal is completely apart, you can reassemble the seal exactly how it was received, uh, with all the parts back in their exact same position um, and orientation. Uh, now, that's very important on highly engineered seals that you're doing a seal failure analysis on. Now, say a boiler feed pump from a nuclear plant, uh, you're, you're going to absolutely have to document exactly where everything was, which part was contacting which part, um, even down to which spring was in, in, in which position. Um, now, you don't, you don't have to be that uh, methodical all the time, but it is a good practice to get into. You never know when you're going to want to go back and say, oh, is this... You know, was this spring on the inboard side or the outboard side? Uh, or, you know, which, which O-ring was this? Um, you don't want to have to lose that evidence. So, uh, really, it doesn't take any time. It actually saves time. Uh, let's start with the assembly, assembly fixtures. Let's get all you loosened up. Now, for the purposes of, the, of this video, I'm not going to tag everything absolutely exactly as it was found, because um, that would that would take some really some unnecessary time. You you get the point. Um, but we are going to tag the critical ones. And again, the, the the objective here is to not disassemble the seal as fast as possible and show off in front of the customer about how good we are with an Allen wrench. The idea is actually to inspect the parts as you go. So take some time. Okay, so once we get all of these off, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to tag them all and put them in the same bag. Um, just because I like to kind of conserve my special Ziploc bags here, what I would do in this case is I'm going to label this. These are screws number 19 and setting fixtures uh, number 18. So let's get those in the bag. What I'm going to do now is, uh, again, just inspect as you go. Um, I wouldn't go nearly this fast in a normal seal failure analysis, uh, but the important thing here is I want to show you uh, some best practices. So the next thing we'll do is take out these screws. Now again, if I wanted to, I could actually label each threaded hole A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4, and put each screw in, a, in an individual bag. On some engineered seals, I do that. Uh, on, the, on these, I, I, I don't need to, uh, but I, I certainly could. And again, inspect as you go. For things like set screws, you want to inspect uh, the mating surface here. See if they're a little bit flattened out. See if it looks like maybe one is really mashed and the other three are not. Since those screws are pretty easily identifiable, I'm going to go ahead and put them in this bag. Uh, and these are screws number 16. In they go. Okay, I've now got the uh, the retaining ring out of the um, out of the out of the sleeve driver. Uh, and again, since this is a, a fairly easily identifiable part, um, I'm going to go ahead and put it in this bag uh, with some of the other small parts. And again, ordinarily, I would inspect as I go. I would look for any sort of deviations or anything that looks odd in terms of corrosion, wear, uh, bending, um, you name it. Now, the, the next thing I'm going to do, uh, you, you might not be used to, and this is something I call indexing. And indexing is very important because on, on the rotating assembly and on the stationary assembly, there were parts that were in proximity throughout the life of the seal. And again, remember I said I want to assemble this seal just the way I found it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, I'm going to find some, something that's identifiable. Let's say 
let's say this this uh, set screw hole right here. I'm going to put a mark right there, and I'm also going to mark the ID of the sleeve. That way, I can line these up again if I have to. If I find something that's a, you know, that's a, a wear mode uh, or or anything else unusual. And take your time. Okay, now if I need to, I can put this assembly on back just exactly like it was. Um, just like I put this mark on the driver, before I take the seal ring off, I'm going to mark it as well. That way I can line everything back up exactly the way it was when I received the seal. Not always important, but someday this is going to save you. Okay, I'm going to lift this out. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to inspect as I go, but I'm also going to index. Okay, see now since I have my index mark on the ID, on the seal ring, and the sleeve, I can reassemble this seal exactly as it was. And you can keep going. Uh, you know, as, as, you, as you pull this apart, you're going to have uh, more parts. What you can do is index and bag those as you go. For example, I've got a little O-ring in here. I'm going to very carefully take that out. And right when I take it out, because you can't really mark an O-ring without damaging it permanently, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it where that index mark is. So I know where this was, and I can go back in my report and say everything that's indexed called out the 12 o'clock position. So now when I'm looking at this O-ring, I know this is the 12 o'clock position, and I can go around, and if maybe there's wear uh, or corrosion just in one part of the O-ring, I can now document where it was relative to everything else in the sleeve. Not always important, but you're never going to have a chance to do this again. Once you've taken a seal apart, uh, this, this evidence is essentially lost, and I'm teaching you how to capture it. Okay, so this was, um, this was part number 15. Now, in case this seal has been in some sort of hazardous service, I like to use these tags for O-rings as well. The reason is it's very difficult to inspect an O-ring through a Ziploc bag. Uh, contrast that to these parts, which I tagged and bagged. I can pretty much look at those and inspect them. If I just need to go back and maybe look at something uh, a second time or, or uh, maybe look at a surface, I can do it through the Ziploc without having to open it up and lose my tagging. With an O-ring, you want to be able to feel it stretch. You want to look at all of the surfaces. Um, you're going to want to you're going to want to take out um, some calipers and measure its cross-section. Uh, you're going to look for uh, blistering, swelling, all those things that we look for. But here you always have it tagged. So I could, I could keep going. You, you get the point. Um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to skip some of the rotating parts and skip to the, to the stationary parts. So let's put these aside for a second. Now, when I look at stationary parts, these are a little bit diff more difficult to index, but you still have to do it. And instead of just picking some place that's arbitrary, what I like to do is find top dead center. Okay? Now, for this seal, it can be installed a variety, in a variety of seals, but the vent is, the, is typically top dead center on this one. Um, so what I'm going to do is just mark that. And I might also jot that down in my notes in case this mark gets washed off. Um, same thing, what I'm going to do is reach down in here and I'm just going to put a dot on the state on that stationary face before I pull it out. Okay? Now, see, that is, that's indexed forever, as long as I don't clean that dot off. Let's say, for example, that this seal was rotation specific. I can go back and I can document Many months from now, if I want, I can look at the drive pin 
and see which side the wear is on. And I know exactly which slot that drive pin engaged. Okay? Now I, now I can establish the direction of rotation of the seal. I'm going to do the same thing with the O-ring. Because, again, you can't really index an O-ring very well. So I'm going to pinch it at 12 o'clock as it comes out. And I'm going to hold that pinch point until I'm done examining it. So I can look at stretch, I can measure its cross section, I can inspect all of the surfaces and jot down any of the notes relative to top dead center of that O-ring. As soon as I let go of that pinch point, that evidence is gone. So this is your chance to record all that. And uh, we'll do the same thing. That was, that was O-ring number 10. So I'm going to go ahead and tag it. Okay, now it's recorded. And, and I can keep going. See, I still have a long ways to go because, because this is a dual seal. I have another seal face. I have another O-ring. Um, I, so, I have two sets of springs. Um, normally what I'll do, um, again, this is a good practice is I will I will take out all the springs these are all the outboard seal springs I'll take all of those out and I'll show you what I do when I inspect these what I usually do before I tag them is I line them all up just like that because I want to make sure that number one, they're all the same spring. They all look about the same. They're the same length. They all have the same amount of coils. They all have about the same kind of color. Um, and and I'll, I'll usually jot down any notes just in case I do find a deviation. In a serious failure, you might find a few springs that are completely broken. You might find some that, that are elongated. You might find some that are corroded or filled with, uh, with with goop. And again, since since these springs are identifiably different than these other parts that we tagged in here, I can go ahead and put them in there. And these are number 11. And then I'll make sure when I take out the inboard seal springs, I'll put them I'll put them in a different bag. Now, one of the problems that you're going to come across in terms of indexing a seal is uh, it's fairly easy to get a mark to stay on silicon carbide until you clean it. One of the things that we want to do is index a carbon. So again, what I'll do is I'll find my index mark on the flange. There it is right there. I'll align it with the fold in my drawing here. And I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and put one on this side of the flange. I'm going to put one on the gasket while I'm there. And I usually take, again, I use my red Sharpie. That's kind of my designated color here in Charlotte. And I'll go ahead and mark the carbon. Okay. That mark's probably not going to stay there because uh, carbon is it's very absorbent. And once, once you clean a carbon, anything on the surface is going to be gone. But once I have it marked, I can also mark this O-ring, again, using the pinch method. And probably now what I'll do is stop and record all of the deviations and interesting observations about this carbon. Knowing full well that mark might be really hard to find a week from now. Okay? So now that I have this mark, I can look how this slot compares to this drive pin. How um, uh, if there was another drive pin, I can line those up. Um, was there any wear that was relative to the flush ports? Um, and that sort of thing. And again, I can use that same pinch method on, on this dynamic O-ring and then go ahead and immediately record all the observations about that O-ring. That's how you build a good, um, uh, a good set of observation data.